morning. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome once again to Veritas Community Church. As you're making your way back to your seats, it's a joy to be with you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here. My name is Dan, and it's a joy to worship with you, to confess with you, to fellowship with you, interact, and goad one another on toward love and good deeds. Six days ago, at 9.30 in the morning, I was leaving Speedway, and I noticed the morning paper. Amazing pictures of outer space filled the front page. I stopped, I stared at something most spectacular. A jaw-dropping beauty held my attention, motionless for I don't really know how long. The $10 billion NASA's new James Webb Space Telescope is now releasing pictures of the universe nobody has ever seen. According to the NASA administrator, Bill Nelson, if you held a grain of sand on the tip of your finger at arm's length, that is the part of the universe you are seeing. Just one little speck of this entire universe. Their hope, according to this article, is to look at the galaxies <clears throat> from afar away, more than 13 billion light years away. So that number didn't mean a whole lot to me initially. And so I, I, I went to work. I tried to put it in context and my source told me this, that to travel one light year, Veritas would need to jump into a space capsule, and then traveling five miles per second, it would take us about 37,200 human years to travel one light year. This telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, is said to be able to see more than 13 billion light years away in order to witness over a million galaxies throughout the universe. Well, one of the head astronomers, Caitlin Casey, mentioned that their desire is to study the structure of the entire universe from a bird's eye view. I was trying to picture that. I, I, I guess the telescope has to then somehow get outside of creation, outside the universe, and then look back on it and we can see the entire structure of the universe. The report concluded, quote, and as with any scientific instrument with new capabilities, no one really knows what secrets the Webb telescope will reveal about the universe we live in. I don't know how many have seen some of the pictures out there. A few, many. They're, they're stunning. And I am extremely thankful that we have the capability to develop telescopes that can look at and take pictures of our amazing universe. And I can hardly wait for many more pictures to come in from the James Webb Telescope. But there is something missing with these pictures. As I was viewing these pictures and reading some articles, something very specific was missing from the amazing Webb Telescope. It needs one more lens through which viewers can peer through the Webb telescope. A lens not made with hands. A lens that will not just observe jaw-dropping beauty, but will actually and infallibly interpret it. We have that lens today. If you have your Bibles, 
open them up to Psalms 19 as we continue our series and conclude our series in the Psalter. Psalm 19, the whole poem. Once you get there, please stand with reverence and anticipation as we listen to the very voice of God through the pages of Scripture. Sing this poem to our hearts. Psalm 19, to the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. The voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber. And, like a strong man, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, more to be desired than they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then... I shall be blameless and innocent of the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And Father, we stand in awe of you. We pray that our eyes will be illumined, our hearts will be accessed by you, softened and supple in the midst of splendor. We pray that you will bow our hearts to your sovereignty, that will move towards your generosity. You will gain all the worship and praise and thanksgiving and adulation from your people. You will get all the glory this morning and each day thereafter. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And you may be seated. So a few have already chastised me, and I don't blame you. We started seven weeks ago on this great big grand book, an epic book called the Psalter, or the Psalms, 150 poems written over about 900 years, compiled and collated and put in uh, certain um, positions and, and categories to compile a whole book took about 1,100 years from start to finish. And this book has been preserved down through the ages. Once it was collated and put together, it was used by God for the post-exilic people coming out of Babylon, coming out of hopelessness and back into the land. Now they have to think and rethink, does God keep His promise? Or does He renege on the Davidic covenant. He's the one who said that he would, through David, install his king upon his throne, and his king would crush the enemy's head and liberate his people and bring about a whole new society, a whole new world, and he would reign with his riches over his people forevermore. You're the one who said it, and now it looks dim and distant at best. This psalms This Psalter, this book, is to breathe life into God's people, to keep hope alive, because hope deferred makes the heart sick. 
So that's kind of the overarching understanding of the, of the book. And then so we, we, we launched into it in Psalms 1 and 2, and that was the introduction. And, and we said this was kind of the doorway into a psalmic world. And we were to go through that doorway, and we looked at some characters, and we looked at the plot line. And then we started seeing that it was organized into five books. There were, they were book one, book two, book three, book, book four, and book four, five. And so we noticed that, that hope commenced, and then it was cringing, and then it was crashing. And then, in book four, it began to regain and come back. And then in book five, it crescendos to the praise of God's glory. The whole book in Hebrew is titled Telahim, or praises in the midst of all the pain. Two-thirds of the poems are lamentations. And all the perplexities that stirred around the heart, it was moving this group forward to a pinnacle, to a crescendo, so that he would get all the glory. Our delight in him would terminate and he would receive all the praise from his people. And so some of you said, why are we back in Psalm 19? It's kind of anticlimactic. We were moving through those books. We got into the first book, Psalm 107, and we were going to go to the conclusion, which is Psalms 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150. And I'm back in 19. Why? I don't know. But one reason that came to me is I want to give you a, a gift from the Psalms that would linger with you all the days of your life. That Psalms 1 started, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. And Psalm 107 called us to meditate day and night upon the grandeur and glory of God. And it's going to get tough. Some of you are in great duress even as I speak. And so I wanted to give you this psalm as a way of focusing and fueling your hope all the days of your lives because the days are evil, because the days are difficult, and you're going to face even more of those. So we went back, and we're now into Psalm 19. Psalm 19 reflects Psalm 1 quite a bit. And what I wanted to do, I couldn't do, and I was going to go into Psalm 119, but that would take us two and a half hours to even read it. So we went back to 19, and 1 and 19 and 119 reflect one another quite a bit. They're called wisdom psalms. So I thought, that's why. It's doable, it's readable, and it's pass onable to you. So that's why I chose this, and today we're going to look at this poem. Now, anytime a speaker speaks or a book is read, you have to ask the question, what is the author talking about? And then secondly, what is he saying about what he's talking about? So the title of the message is usually the, the topic. And our topic for today is God Reveals His Glory. It's fascinating. He did not have to reveal anything to humans. And he, he, he unveils himself, and we see this, this blinding beauty, jaw-dropping, astounding glory. Where? Where does he reveal his glory? So if you felt the, the poem moving... You saw three stanzas there, and the first one is way, way up in the sky, God reveals his glory. And then it, it, it stopped. It was jolting, at least to me. It, it, it felt like I was, I was in the, 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 the car of one of my children at age 15 to 16, and they were coming up to a stop sign. I'm going... It's, it's a stop sign. That means, you know, like, stop, like right now, like now. And they'd go, Oof! and it would just completely stop. And then I'd say, okay, now it's, you know, like left and right. Now it's time to start and go, and we'd start. It feels that jolting to my eyes 
going from way, way out there in the skies and dropping down into the Scriptures. He's doing the same thing, but more enriching, more revealing. God's revealing His glory from the skies to the Scriptures, and then something happens in this psalm. Instead of teaching and preaching, David steps back and does something different. Verses 11 through 14, the glory of God revealing from the skies to the Scriptures right into the soul. And that's where we'll end our series on the Psalter. So, you got your Bibles open? I don't know if anything came up there. It doesn't matter because we have our Bibles. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 5, God reveals His glory in the skies. Look at verses 1 and 2 with me. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out His speech. Night to night reveals His handiwork. So it starts off in the skies as the Creator. If, you, if you're like me, you, you, you like to kind of walk outdoors. You kind of like to look around. And, and when, we, when we see a sunrise, when the hue is kind of purple and pink and, and alluring and soft, almost caressing our face, we say, wow. And, and when the moon pops out big and round and it's, it's reflecting uh, the full light of, of the sun back onto us, we say, you know, wow. And, and when Lisa and I and, and one of our children, Brittany, we had just her, and we moved out to Montana, and we were, we were out on this, this ranch, and, and there, was, there was no light pollution at all. And I went out of this trailer, and it was just jet black. You couldn't see anything except when you lifted up and outward and looked on the Montana skies. It wasn't like twinkle here or twinkle there. These were sheets of stars, and it was, it was overwhelming. What is going on out there in the skies? We saw the, the Webb telescope is piercing out there and seeing things like never before. Galaxies spinning every which way. What does that mean? Well, at this point, we don't know because it's nonverbal. He is just expressing himself in his creation as all beautiful, all glorious, all powerful. You see the, the parallelism there. He says his glory is in the heavens, his handiwork is in the skies, and they are proclaiming and declaring. Those are ing words. They keep going. And verse 2 says it very clearly. Day to day pours out speech. It's, it's a metaphor. It's a, it's a word picture. It, it almost looks like the, the pot of water is boiling, and then it and then it leaps over the pan, and it's boiling over. That's the, the, the essence of it. The, the sense of it here is one day cannot contain his immensity, his brilliance, his majesty, his glory. It just spills out onto the next day, and the next day, and the next day. It cannot contain it, is the point of this boiling over. So here we have... God's revealing of His beauty, revealing of His glory up into the clouds, up into the space, up into the stars in His creation. But then notice verse 3. It's a little hard to translate, but you get the gist of it. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. And so what we are experiencing here is, is kind of like... It's nonverbal communication. He doesn't say a word. He's just giving you a big picture of his power and of his beauty. 
just in Dayton, perhaps, or maybe Ohio, or, or maybe the United States, the next piece of that goes out to the furthest part of creation, at least, at least the world here, and it says, their words go to the end of the world. I love that. To the end of the world. Wherever you go in this world, look up, look outward, and you will see a display of God's glory, His matchless supremacy in all of His creation. Front and center. There it is. But then He brings us down to the sun. You see that in verse 6, I think? Five and six. Now he's starting to to really try to get our imagination, and and so he starts describing the sun, this this big blazing center of of glory and power and beauty, and and it and it, it has a circuit, and it comes up and it goes down, and it comes up and it goes down. Please don't pull me. Aside after the the service and say that's not what the sun does. The the earth is turning into the sun. It's stationary. I understand. This is metaphoric, okay? And it's it's doing this circuit, and it's it's glorious and it's brilliant. And so three three days ago, when we didn't have the cloud cover and it was extremely hot, about 10 a.m. I was standing next to my car, and I don't care if anyone was looking, I just closed my eyes and tilted my head 45 degree angle, and I just started thinking, what am I feeling? What do you think I felt? One word. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. It was, it was heat, heat. Now that might not strike you as being unusual because it's extremely hot. But 93 million miles away, there's a source of heat. Now, I love bonfires. I like to get near a a fire when it's a little chilly, and you get about 10 feet from it, and you go, ooh, I feel heat. Get out to about 8 feet or 6, and you don't want to get burned, but 6 to 8 feet. This is 93 million miles away, and I'm feeling heat on my eyelashes and eyelids and my what in the world is going on with creation and you see this beautiful brilliance and it's got these two word pictures one is the bridegroom coming out of the chamber I think what's happening here is he's getting married and so his entourage the the wedding party is with him he's coming out of the chamber and he's going down the street, and it was a, a Hebrew celebration. And they were just really jazzed that the bridegroom's getting married. And knock, knock, and there's the dad, and you know, a, may I have her hand, and just taking her in, and that's joy. That's celebration. And then you have this runner. I don't know if it's an athlete or a warrior, but this, this runner um, does not uh, consider any kind of risk in his life. He's going out there and he's going to lay it out there completely and utterly for joy. That's just brilliant. So this is a bulging, billowing beauty that's arresting the heart and creating joy. And you see that all over creation. God reveals his glory above in the skies. But there's something missing with nonverbal revelation, isn't there? We have to have written revelation, otherwise we are going to conclude erroneously and begin to fall in love with creation rather than the Creator. It happens globally, every day, all the time. And it doesn't take high intellect like a 160 IQ to pierce into this and go, oh, I get it now. 
Simple people like you and me could gaze at the, the heavens and get it right if we have this filter through which we can look at creation, namely 7 through 10, the scriptures. Case in point, I was, I was looking at some writings from Stephen Hawking and uh, a brilliant thinker, um, and um, he was trying to figure out the universe, and he was cranking out all kinds of books and all kinds of, of uh, articles and, and changing um, uh, the world as we know it. And as he was getting closer to death, he died, I think, in about 2000, I don't know when it was, 2010 or 11 or not very long ago. When he was dying, one of the questions was, Dr. Hawking, is there life after death? And, and he, I think he's, he's speaking, now he's typing this, I don't know how he was communicating, but he said these words, the brain is a computer. Let that one rest in your mind for a while. The brain is merely a computer, and when the computer crashes, it's thrown away. He said these words, there is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. What we're looking at here this morning is not about intellect. It's, it's not about a high IQ. It's not about a, a, a highly sophisticated scientific look at creation. I'm not opposed to intellect. I'm not an anti-intellectualist at all. I love the tools and the resources and the discoveries, but all they can do is observe. They cannot interpret. There has to be written revelation in order to interpret the observations of creation. Otherwise, we become idolaters. And in the end, it is an awful, terrifying prospect. So, the poem shifts, and we come tumbling way out there in the skies, down into our laps, down into a book, into the scriptures. And the tempo starts picking up. And, and, and he gives us six nouns, six verbs, and six adjectives. Going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. He's not talking about six different things. He's talking about the same thing in different angles, in different ways, kind of like six characteristics of one thing, namely written revelation. So let's take a, a quick look at what David is doing here under the inspiration of the Spirit. He's looking at scriptures and he starts talking about what the Word is and then he ends this section with what the Word does. What, what does the Word, what is it? Well, he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, and then drop down. The testimony of the Lord is sure, then the precepts of the Lord are right, then the commandment of the Lord is pure, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, the rules of the Lord are true. So he goes down this list, it's all parallel, synonymous parallelism, and he's, he's getting at one basic thing. But before we start looking at nouns and verbs and adjectives, which I know you all this morning woke up and said, oh, I hope he talks about nouns and verbs and adjectives, notice repetition. And notice the contrast in verses 1 through 6. He's calling the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. We've, we've looked at this in the Psalms before, and here it is in plain sight. This is our English way, English version of saying his name. This is God's name. When he gets really close to people with his word, he is disclosing himself, not just a title. Look at verses 1 through 6. He says it only one time. 
the glory of God, Elohim. You, you see that in Genesis 1, when Elohim said, and then there's creation. Elohim said, and then there's creation. Day and night, day and night. There's a, a big connection between Psalm 19 and Genesis 1 and 2. Day and night, Elohim, his sheer power, he speaks and there it is. But now he's, he's, he's close and he's, he's touching and he says, Yahweh, 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 six times. Please don't miss that because there's a major shift from abstract, impersonal, out there, creator, now into Yahweh. And as we looked a couple Sundays ago, Yahweh is a tough name to translate, but it says, I am that I am. But you, you kind of work it through, and it's like, all that I am, I am to you, to you, to you, and you, and to you, and you, and it's very tender, it's very touching, it's very close. This is his revelation of glory. All that I am, I am to you. Some years back, Lisa and I were on the beach of North Carolina, and it was dusk to dark, and we were out there looking at creation. It's beautiful. I highly commend it to you. And this moon comes out. I highly commend, even if there's bugs that are bugging you, don't worry about it. Just gaze upon his creation. And there was an observation made. The moon is reflecting the sun. Okay, we get that. And then it reflects right onto the water, the ocean. And it's coming right at you. And all of a sudden, the, the moon beam is just right there, right hitting you. Have you ever done that before? It's amazing. And if you go... Guess what it does? It's like, ha, it's just right there. And Lisa could go clear over here and say, what do you see? Well, the moon beams on me. And I'm going, no, it's not. It's on me. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, that, that imagery is just right on you. All that I am, I am to you. Now, here is my word. And he gives us his word in a personal touching way, the law, instruction, the testimonies, self-authenticating, the precepts, a, a road map leading to the destination, which was the Torah or the law, the, the commandment, it's authoritative, it's, it's, it's every single thing he says is right and true and commanding. And, and the fear of the Lord, it's the results of, it develops us into reverential, awe-inspired, treating Him as King kind of people. And the rules, they, they discern, they arbitrate what is out of bounds and what is in bounds, and it's all in here. It says it's perfect and sure and right and pure and clean and, and true. All those adjectives. This is leading up to one major thing, isn't it? We're talking about utter quality with His Word. No blemish. No faults. Nothing lacking. His Word is whole and blameless. Blemish-free. What is he talking about? The Bible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but through, through the words, is there not just something but someone I'm supposed to see? And, and so as we think more broadly in Bible, John picks it up in John 1 and says, In the beginning was the Word. It's called Logos, the, the Word. Harking us back to Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. And he starts blending this together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with 
God. He's with him? Like a word? Who is this? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything that was created was created through the Word. Nothing exists without Him speaking and upholding. He's the Word. John, tell me more. You start reading John chapter 1, you get down to 14, and the Word became flesh. So this is the pre-incarnate Christ who's now incarnated. He's on earth. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, full of grace and truth. So in this Psalm 19, hearing the, the perfection of the Word, we are to move towards a bigger picture of just words to see the Word. Jesus, later on in that Gospel, in John chapter 5, was talking to people who had double doctorates in biblical theology in the Old Testament. They are Pharisees. The Sadducees weren't quite that, that good in Bible, but they weren't too bad. They, they were people of the book. And he came up to them and he said in, in John 5, 39 and 40, he said, you search the Scriptures, these pages, because you think in them is life. And they are witnessing me. And you don't come to me in order to have life. What's he talking about? I don't want to leave you thinking that the Bible is the destination. It's a glorious book. It's inspired. It's authoritative, the verbal, plenary, authoritative, inspired word. Sleep with it if you must. Get into it each day and every day, but know that it's a vehicle or a window through which you can view the Word. The Word. And in Hebrews 1, it, it, it said, God... In, at many times and in many ways long ago, talked to the fathers through the prophets. But in this day, this last day, He has spoken to us in His Son, who is the heir of all things and through whom all things were created. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining the entire universe by His spoken word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Please don't miss that. The word is not just an intellectual hobby to figure out mystery. It's a vehicle. It's, it's an escort. By his spirit, with his word, we, we encounter the word way out there, and yet he came on earth, and, and, and he, he, he's so utterly powerful, he sustains this whole universe by just his thought, and he's the one who went to the cross to provide purification for all your sins, and then he was up out of the grave and went into heaven, and he is seated. He's the Davidic reality. He's the one who came to sit on the throne and rule and reign over this entire universe. God reveals his glory in the skies and down into the scriptures and now something starts happening for David. He's not doing just what I'm doing here of preaching or teaching. He's not just speaking the word to, to one another like verses 1 through 2. Something has happened. Something has changed. Did you see it? Verse 11. Moreover, by them is your servant... Drop down to verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from my hidden faults. Who's he speaking to? I thought he was just teaching. 
It's what he is doing, verses 1 through 10. Verse 13, keep back your servant also from the presumptuous sins. And then he ends by saying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Yahweh, your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Do you see what just happened? You can't get around the word like this very long before you've got to sit it down, set it down, and get on your knees and look into the glories of his revelation and start speaking to him. We must respond. We don't just put a book down in a notebook filled with copious notes and say, there. It masters us, we don't master it. And now you're starting to see the results of this kind of revelation. It's way, way out there. There's a trillion deists that have walked this earth and have given lip service to the Creator. It ain't going to do anything. There are those who, who have studied this book inside out, upside down, have double doctorates, And it ain't going to do anything until the word goes deeper still right into the soul. And it begins to revive the soul, enlighten the eyes, give wisdom to the simple. It's working. It's developing. It's stirring. It's giving us hope in the midst of darkness. It ends, and I will too, on this note. As he's praying, he asks for two things. That you will so work in my life through your word that I can see creation and recreation, redemption. And see my redemption, see what he did on the cross on my behalf so that I am declared righteous, I'm declared innocent, I'm kept from The great transgression. Did you see it in there? Keep me from the great transgression. Paul the Apostle in Romans 1 looks back and gives us an inspired commentary on Psalm 19. It's found in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through, I don't know, 25, 26. And in 25... He says that we have exchanged, traded treasures, God's glory for creation. And he calls it the lie. There's an article there. It's not just a a little fib. The lie, the great transgression, takes us back into Genesis 3, 1 through 6. And now we see the great lie. And all that we're talking about here, all that we're seeing is revelation of his beauty and power and now his his personal peace to it of Jesus and and the gospel and whatnot keeps us away from looking at Jesus, looking at God Almighty and going, I'm starting to get bored. Your creation is really starting to get its upper hand in my life. I love the walk on the beach. I love the hike in the mountains. I love golf. I just told you things I love, by the way. I love the bike ride. I love the gentle breeze caressing my face. I love the smell of flowers. I love all. You better be careful that we don't exchange the glory of God for the glory of creation and start falling in love with the the creation rather than the creator. Who is blessed forever, he says. So the point of all of this is God revealing himself to us way out there into a book and now piercing our hearts and opening our eyes, illumining the eyes and stirring up the heart so that we will see and savor the, 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 the majesty and mercy of God. You see it in two parts. When that is occurring, day in and day out, we revel in Scripture and we recoil from sin. 
when those two pistons are firing in our lives, we can be pretty certain that God, through His Holy Spirit, through Jesus' Word, is, is moving and stirring and keeping us away from the great transgression into the great glories of God that we praise and adore and move out in faith and obedience. So that's why I chose Psalm 19, that I can give you one poem that you can meditate on, memorize, organize, and then plunge deep in to see and savor, to realize and relish the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, it's like a good book. I love to open up the first page and read the first sentence. I can hardly wait to go into and walk with and dive into a good book. But I hate to come to the end. The Psalms does not have to end here. So thank you, O oh precious one, for giving us a glimpse of your glory all through the universe, giving us clarity, perspicuity, all through the scriptures and by your spirit, piercing our hearts, going deep within and stirring our affections for you, keeping us away from sin and toward the Savior. So what more could we ask? Keep fueling our fire, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.